Teresa Bachman, Director of Operations and Programming at the Palace Theater for Westmoreland Cultural Trust. Welcome back for another segment of our virtual tour. Today we're going to explore inside the theater, starting with the loge and balcony seats. The loge is the first five rows of the theater overlooking the orchestra level and the stage, by many considered to be the prime space to see ballet, musical theater, symphony concerts because of the depth of the stage that you can see. The balcony seats are higher up, above the walkway in our theater. In 1926, balcony seats were 15 cents and loge seats were 25 cents. In 1996, the balcony seats were replaced, reducing its capacity by over 200 seats to provide more space between rows and in the seating area themselves. It also allowed us to make them padded seats. The original seats were wooden with minimal padding and, and leather on them and very tight. There were also four sections in the original configuration with a left and a left center and a right and a right center section with three aisles. The 1996 renovations combined the left and right sections to make one large center section measuring 20 seats across with most rows in the side sections having three to seven seats. The 96 renovations also brought us an elevator which accesses the second, third and fourth floors of the theater fourth floor being at the top level of the balcony. The third floor stop accesses to the walkway between the loge and the balcony, and the second floor accesses our Megan Suite on the second floor of the theater. The renovations also took out one row on the left and right sides of the loge seats to make a larger walkway area as guests come into the theater to be seated. Some of those original loge seats were later installed in the top of the balcony on the left and right sides and the top row of the center section. Those original loge seats show the mohair fabric that was part of the upholstery of those original seats from the 20s. The dome that you see above the loge seating originally had red, green, and blue lights that would blink to the Wurlitzer organ music during the vaudeville shows. The ceiling dome is made of homosote, an acoustical tile. This tile allows optimal projection of performers. The renovations that we did in that phase allowed us to increase the capacity of our lighting and sound systems. We installed lighting perches that descend from the ceiling, these metal brown frames that allowed us to have additional positions for what we call front of house lighting to illuminate the stage. They're accessible by an opening at the top that resembles the shape of home plate. That allows the crew to descend into the perch area and adjust the lighting focus or replace the gels to create a different hue of color on the stage. If you look carefully, you can see yellow ropes within those perches. The yellow rope allows the crew to lower a bucket down to the main orchestra level of the theater so that equipment can be raised up through the rope. For instance, a lighting instrument with a cable clamp on it can be lifted up to them or other supplies in a bucket. The lighting perches can be accessed by a 55-foot ladder that is on stage left near the dressing room entrance. That allows the crew to walk up above the ceiling that you see here and descend through that home plate opening into the perches. And they can work up there to create the focus they need for a given performance. On the back of each perch are speaker clusters and new speakers were also installed in the mesh that you see above the proscenium arch, spanning the whole width of the stage. That sound system also included different clusters of speakers installed in the ceiling of the balcony in different levels where the pitch changes to optimize the sound for the audiences in the balcony seating area. With our sound system improvements, this system was considered state-of-the-art in 1996 and was featured on the cover of a sound industry magazine. In the balcony ceiling, you see some large circular deflectors. Those simply deflect the air conditioning and the heat that is dispensed by our HVAC system. There are additional deflectors that are triangular in shape above the low seating in four corners. At the top of the balcony is our projection room, not used at this time since we seldom have movies, but you can still find vintage projectors up there and supplies left by the projectionists from days gone by. The next phase that we'll cover is our murals, painted by Louis Grell. Mr. Grell was enlisted to paint these murals by the Manos family. He went to study with the great masters of Europe at the age of 14, studying in France and England, coming back and settling down in the Midwest in Cedar Bluffs, Iowa. 
His works are installed throughout many civic buildings, churches, auditoriums, and so forth throughout the United States, but predominantly out in the Midwest. Mr. Grell based his murals here on French fairy tales. There are three murals installed here on the left and right sides of the loge, and there is a third mural that has long been covered up by the comedy and tragedy mask that you see above the stage opening, painted over long ago. That mural spans the whole width of that space from the left to the right sides. These murals had been covered up at some point in time by red and gold fabric that you see higher up on the walls of the balcony section. That fabric was removed in the mid 1990s and we found that each mural had furring strips with about 1500 nails hammered into each mural to fix the fabric. Part of the process of the mural restoration included removing those furring strips and enlisting Christine Dalton, a conservator of art who was engaged to restore our murals. She and a team of workers had to work diligently to remove the nails more than 1,500 in each painting, carefully to avoid damage to the surrounding painting. They use special solvents and chemicals to clean the surfaces of each mural and filling the holes left behind and then painting those holes to blend in with the surrounding colors of the murals, a special process called in-painting. She started work first on the left mural as you're viewing the stage, working throughout the summer with scaffolding set up so that she and her team had room for supplies. The scaffolding extended to the main floor and required that we shut down for the summer and not host any shows. After the left mural was finished, she began work on the right mural. This took a little more time than planned and September rolled around in that year. So we had to suspend the completion of that work until January when again, we had a gap in our shows. Years later, the plaster work was replicated by special craftsmen to simulate what was in place before the fabric and furring strips had covered each mural. At one point, we thought that the mural with the comedy tragedy masks would never be seen again. We learned later that art conservation has improved dramatically, and it's possible that someday we may be able to use special chemicals to remove this layer of paint and reveal the hidden mural underneath. Restoration of the third mural would require such extensive scaffolding, periods of time, and funding that it's simply not on our horizon at this time. Years ago, Richard Grell reached out to us. He was the nephew of Louis Grell, the artist. He was researching his uncle's work throughout the country and made this one of his first stops. When he saw the murals here, he told me there were two things that struck him. One is that they were painted directly on the surface of the walls. Most of Mr. Grell's murals had apparently been done on canvas and then shipped to the destination and installed there. These murals are painted directly on the surface. The other thing he noted was that in the bottom left corner of the left mural is a signature. Louis Grell, he told us, was a very humble man who often didn't sign his own works. What appears here is a printed name with a slight slant to it and a period after that name. He asked me if that was part of the original mural. We connected him by phone to Christine Dalton, the restorer, the conservator of these pieces. And they later exchanged files and information and doc she documented her works for him and the process that she and her team took to restore these murals. And it was verified that that was indeed a signature of Louis Grell. The life of Louis Grell was featured by the Theater Historical Society of America in their periodical Marquee with 24 pages of stories about his various works throughout the country, four pages of which are devoted to the murals here at the Palace Theater. Another phase of renovations occurred in 1999 when we replicated the opera boxes. The opera box seats are not necessarily the best vantage point to see a show, but it allows you to be seen. The opera boxes had been removed in the late 70s and a wall had been put on either side. They were replicated based on architectural drawings. For our 90th anniversary in 2016, we finally replicated the gold painting on the craftsman's plaster that had been installed on the facades of all of the opera box seats. When the theater opened in the height of vaudeville in 1926, there was a nine piece orchestra led by Emil Rasvelaire, who had been over at the Strand Theater and drafted over into the Manos to lead their team. The musicians were positioned in the pit. The original pit was located 
under the front 10 feet of the stage, downstage of where you see the main curtain. The orchestra was down there, accessible through a small room under the stage. The original seating configuration extended much closer to the seats. That's how, in part, we had a higher capacity of 2,100 people, almost 800 more than we currently see today. The original Wurlitzer organ was in the left corner of the stage as you're facing it, near where the American flag is today. In 1960, Dick Klein from Thurmont, Virginia, purchased our organ, took it to Maryland, and put it in storage while he built a grand home to, to fill in this organ, which was actually merged with the Fox Theater from Washington, D.C. He used many of the pipes and parts from our organ to create a grand instrument in his own residence. Many albums were recorded there, and our organ was credited on the back cover of those albums. The original organ pipes were located behind the mini chandeliers on each side where you see that grill work. Mr. Klein took almost a week to painstakingly remove all the parts of the organ. Thanks for joining us today. In our next episode, we'll go on stage.